oh right we're back to the thing that everybody wants more of two white guys with microphones talking about sports there needs to be more of this Hello, everybody, and welcome back to episode 32 of the Coconut Curry podcast. On this episode, we are going to discuss round two of the NBA playoffs. We're going to react to Nick Wright's club superstar, talk about J.J. Redick becoming the Lakers' next head coach, potentially, talk about the NBA draft lottery, and then kind of dive in a little Bronny James stuff because he's been in the media like crazy ever since he um, kind of locked in for the combine in the draft. But before we do all that, if this is your first time here, I'm Justin. We got Peter here as well. Just the two of us today, unfortunately, our co-host Raj is unavailable today, but we're going to press on forward. We're three postgraduate college students from the University of Pittsburgh, and we're on here just talking about sports, hopefully offering a fresh new perspective on things. So if you've made it this far, one minute, please like, comment, subscribe. It helps us out (laughs) a lot as we try to grow our channel. We usually start with reacting to comments, which we're going to do today. I only have one (gasps) comment for us to react to, but it's not really that hot take but i'm going to read it and it says quote i mean the wolves role players are going crazy the whole series and all of a sudden forgot how to play basketball in the nugget series that was from brady ishu underscore eight the only thing i have to say to that is forgot how to play basketball is a very easy way to say like we're blaming the wolves role players when you've on the other side you got nicole Jokic, jamal murray (laughs) and the team that just won the nba champ like in my opinion we'll dive into it a little bit more this is more about the nuggets figuring out the wolves and the wolves players just forgetting how to play i don't know how you feel about that but i think yeah i think it's more that it's not that the wolves forgot how to play it's more that the nuggets finally got out of their own way and put it together and realized oh yeah we have to like actually win games we can't just like coast through and sweep the lakers every single series like we actually have to try yeah yeah i don't i don't feel like the series has changed because of the role players for the the wolves have just started playing but we'll dive more into that but we do appreciate the comment thanks everyone for checking out the darvin ham firing clip that we put on our youtube page <laughs> if you're listening please go check that out um it's gotten some good views in the first 24 hours that it's been up so we appreciate hype. that absolutely hype. next is our disgruntled moment of the week segment. This is our favorite segment. We talk about moments in our life, in the sports world. It could be for ourselves or for other people that make us or them dissatisfied or angry. Thus the word disgruntled. And Peter, we're going to kick it over to you to discuss your disgruntled moment of the week. So my AC unit. For those that don't know, uh, I've lived in this, uh, or I've rented this house for about two years now. And uh, there was an there was a nice little AC unit that came with uh, my room. Uh, there's no central AC, obviously not. It's Pittsburgh. There isn't going to be any <laughs> central AC anywhere in nope. here. Uh, this house was like built in the 30s and renovated in the 70s. They're not going to have that. But there's a nice little AC unit. So I'm like, oh, cool. I'll just like stick it in the in the wall, whatever. It'll be fine. And I go to pick this thing up today, and I look. Finally decide to look you know maybe i'll look inside and see if it's clean or not because like i have a i now have an air purifier in my room because my nose is all messed up and i was like hmm i wonder if it's dirty and i look inside there's just bugs Uh, oh that's good i'm just breathing in dead bugs for like two years i'm gonna not plug that into the wall actually i'm gonna go get another one (laughs) so now i have to go to costco but i haven't gone yet so now i'm currently sitting in my room it is 70 degrees and like what feels like 130 percent humidity out here so i am already sweating we are four minutes in (laughs) my headphones are currently sticking to the outside of my ears this is going to be a very rough podcast but for you guys i'm going to get through it (laughs) I feel you so much. So my bedroom that I record this in, um, for folks who do not know, I am back home for the summer before starting med school. Um, and I we don't have we only have AC like on the first floor, so you do get some residual effect of the air rising, but it tends to just yeah. be hot air rising, and we don't actually like it's not cool. So um, we use AC unit too. I haven't put mine in yet because it burns through the electrical bill. Oh, um, yeah. but yeah, when they're recording this, I'm like, oh man, I'm like sweating. <laughs> exactly. always, a, always a joy putting that thing in. Um, I should have went no moment pants of the week. for this podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, my disgruntled moment of the week is it is really funny that you put your AC unit because last week we had just sports moments. Sometimes we have life stuff, and then this <laughs> exactly. time I'm now I'm talking about the apartment market. So perfect. As as just mentioned, uh, I I graduated Pitt a couple weeks ago, and then I'm going to med school next year. So I'll be going to school. Um, 
over in New Jersey, but I'll be living in Philadelphia and then commuting over on the train. That's not the point. The point is the apartment market sucks. So any bigger city you go into, rent goes increased. Like I applied to uh, Washington DC schools. I applied to Boston schools. All of those rents are through the roof. You're getting a studio apartment, 3000. I kind of just like at the, at the time when I knew that I was just kind of like, it is what it is, pay rent, whatever. But in Philadelphia, it's, it's kind of a similar thing. You could get really crappy studio apartments mm-hmm. before utilities at 1200 and you're living in like a dorm room with the kitchen, your bed, and that's yeah. it. I and mean, that's not like an ideal situation to live in. But it's but only 1200 the- so it's like, okay... Yeah, it's 1200 1300 which is still expensive compared to places like Pittsburgh, where oh, yeah. if you, you get a one-bedroom place in Pittsburgh for probably 1000 Oh, I, my next place that I'm renting, is a, it's a studio for 800 bucks with yeah. water and gas included. Yeah, that, that, that's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and I lived in the last four years, I lived in a dorm building um, because I was an RA and saving money. And so this year, this, I was trying to like get a, a little bit bigger a place to finally have my own space, whatever. But... My God, the prices are so high for everything. Like, you are paying so much money for one bedroom to a point where you're like, it's such, you know, you're getting screwed over, but you almost have no you choice. You have to. Exactly. Because, because you need a place to stay. And if you don't want to live in like a certified dump, you've got to pay a little bit more for it. Um, yeah. But the problem here is the apartments are split, they're either dumps. Or they're really nicely renovated apartments, and I don't there's feel no like there's in between. <laughs> yeah. So like I, I did this. I toured this one apartment with my dad. It was like near eighteen hundred before utilities, and um, it was extremely small, but it had like these granite countertops, and it's like all the cabinetry was super nice, and the bathroom <laughs> was beautiful tile. And I was just like sitting there, like I don't need this. <laughs> exactly. Like, if, if, if you just put like a basic countertop in. And it was just older tile and the hardwood flooring wasn't 100%. that nice. It would bring the rent price down to like 1400 and I'd be much more happy to pay that. Exactly. But, I, but no, like everybody I talked to in the apartment market is like, no, we just want to have like really nice stuff because people will pay for it. I'm like, I don't want to pay for it. Like it's all <laughs> exactly. my loans. I'm not it's paying like, for it. Like guys, like I need to, I just don't want to live in a dumpster. Like I don't need a high end high rise that like I'm pretending to live out my Wolf of Wall Street fantasy in. I just need like a normal apartment. Is it that and, hard? Yeah, and it this is. Part, and this, yeah, and this apartment was so small, like so, like it was probably oh like God. no more than four hundred square feet, and it had one bedroom in it, which is like, it's that works fine for med school. But I was just like. I know that if you just didn't install the granite countertops in the tile, it would be so much cheaper. And I'm like, I don't exactly. need, I don't need the granite countertops, please. Like that's yeah. not and necessary. The thing that's so stupid is like you look at those buildings, and then like they're still fairly close to like the <laughs> holes, so you know that used to be a shithole. It's not a new yes. building. They just renovated the inside and slapped some tile on there. We're like, all right, jack the price up as much as we can. And then it just works because that's all that's available. And and any like young per like in that I was talking to a guy who was touring with me. Shout out Jeff. Um, <laughs> and he was saying like he was a realtor, and he was saying like, yeah, people will pay for this stuff. Like they love the updated stuff. And I was like, because you're young professional, you're making a salary, you'll pay for the place. But I was like, I actually have to, I don't pay for my apartment. Like I'm taking out loans to pay for the apartment that I'll have yeah. to pay back five six years later. I'm like, I can't afford to. <laughs> I yeah. can't pay the increased price now. It's just going to get accrue interest. So exactly. I've been disgruntled about the apartment market, but we did close on an apartment done deal, but it was a big annoying dog. one week, annoying one week of, of course looking at the prices and being pissed off um, to anybody who lives in DC or Boston and you're going to med school. God bless you because you're going to be in so much debt. Yeah. But then you're going to be making bank eventually. So it'll be fine. Yes, eventually. Exa- but, eventually in due time. <laughs> in due time. Alrighty. Alrighty. So that's the Scruntal Movement of the Week. Our favorite segment as always. Unfortunately, we didn't get Raj's take on it, but we will hear it next week, hopefully. Now time to move on to the NBA playoff report. So where we left off last time, because just to catch up in case you didn't watch last episode, <laughs> is the Knicks were up 2-0 on the Pacers. The Timberwolves mm-hmm. were up 2-0 on the Nuggets. And the Thunder series and the Cavs series, had Celtic series, had both started that day. So we had no mm-hmm. coverage on those two series. Some coverage on the other ones that were up 2-0. But that pretty much went out the wazoo because uh, everything got turned upside down. Yeah, everyone got turned upside down. So we're going to start with the series yesterday. Just got tied up 2-2. 
Thunder versus the Mavericks. Like I said, 2-2 mm -hmm. series. Both teams took one on the road. It went Thunder get, win game one, Mavericks game two, Mavericks game three, Thunder game four. I think what's really interesting about this series is Luka has been pretty bad. He's 22-11-8, yeah. which sounds good on face value. 39% shooting, 31 from three, 68 from the free throw line. Averaging like four turnovers a game. Um, yeah. He just hasn't been playing like himself. No. And meanwhile, Shea's on the other side, 32-10-7 on fantastic mm -hmm. shooting. He's do he dominated game four. Um, so it's just been a very interesting series. Um, but yesterday, like... like yeah, yeah go ahead. Like all these series so far, at least, are just like they looked very lopsided at first, except for this one specifically. But they've all now become very good series, besides the Cavs and Celtics. But yeah, what, whatever that actually could strangely turn into a good series. It could. it could out of nowhere. But for right now, it all of these series really do seem very evenly matched because, like, I think teams kind of figured each other out. Or like key injuries happened, or like just like some random crap, whatever. But like it's just been really good basketball, like through and through. Yeah, I mean this series started off with a big OKC win in Game One, but mm -hmm. you you know it's you're at home, Thunder had a ton of rest. You kind of Game felt like, One, okay. like you you yeah. said this in the past, where Game Ones are always like that. You never know what's going to happen there, and specifically. LeBron always like you always felt LeBron lost game one. You're like whatever, he's going to feel it out. I feel like Luca has that vibe to him a little bit, where you're like. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's feeling out game one. Game two, Mavericks win by nine. So close. Game three, yeah. Mavericks win by four. Game game four, Mavericks lose by four. Like, it's just been a very tight series. Mm -hmm. And it's been a dogfight. Like, the refs are letting them... It really has. ...are letting them be physical. Um, You're seeing a lot of low-scoring games. It's funny because people talk about how we live in an era of three-point no shooting, no, no defense. defense. Yeah. 105 to 101. 100 to 96. Uh, game two and uh, game one were a little bit higher scoring, but like these teams are being physical. Last night, everyone mm -hmm. was hitting the deck really hard. Luca hitting the ground, grabbing something. Shea getting like knocked in the face. Chet being physical, just really high end basketball being played. Um, yeah. A big standout here has been PJ Washington out of nowhere, 22 and yeah. nine on efficient shooting. Just the Mavericks, I feel like, have done a great job of building out. Like you had the Kyrie and the Luca, which you were a little nervous about. You're like, oh, two good guards being mm -hmm. the stars. And they've really filled out that front court. Derek Jones Jr., PJ Washington, Derek Lively. They've built out that front and they've been playing mm -hmm. their tails off for yeah. what's otherwise a top heavy roster. Yeah, it's been really impressive watching these role players step up. And like it, I really love seeing that because it's like you get these guys that like no one knew who they were just explode onto the court in the NBA playoffs, the biggest stage imaginable. And it's like you forget that, like, yeah, these guys are no names in the NBA. Like they are still incredibly good at basketball. And like if they get the right chance, they can absolutely take it to the moon. And it's just so awesome to see. Yeah, and specifically for these two teams, like Kyrie's kind of fallen a little bit off of stardom a, l a little bit. So a you feel bit, like yeah, you feel like it's like Shea and Luca, and then a bunch of more role players. So it's really cool to see like you get guys like J, J Dub is Jalen Williams st standing out for the Thunder. Chet's been having and Chet's not been a big name. Um, mm -hmm. So Chet's really stepped up in this series. And again, you get the Derek Lively and the PJ Washington. And you're like you get to see these guys have their moments, yeah. and that's really cool. It um, really is. 2-2 heading back to OKC is very exciting. I was wondering, have our predictions changed at all? So we predicted, you predicted the OKC would win in, thun in seven. I predicted Dallas would win in seven. How are we feeling about that? Sure, I'll keep my <laughs> prediction. I mean, it's going to seven, I feel like, no matter what. And then whoever wins game seven, whatever. <laughs> yeah, um, it's it's been a series where it's just like, why would I change my prediction? Yeah, because, like I don't know. <laughs> yeah, because it's two two, and it, there's been extremely close games. Um, but I think what's the big deal with the series is what what is up with Luca? Because yeah, Luca has been bad. I mean, Luca, listen, he's been fighting through this knee injury that started during the Clipper series. But at a certain point, and we'll we'll get into more injury stuff later. But at a certain point, when you're on the court, you need to play well. Yeah. And he's Luca. He's still getting his teammates opportunities, eight assists a game. But he's just been so inefficient shooting the ball. And yeah, he really has. It's it's been like ugly too. It's just like that's not the kind of Luca we're used to where it's like he kind of just like 
chucks up a shot, makes it, has great efficiency, can just do has like the Luca magic where he could just find a way to get it in the hoop. And now it's like he's just chucking up shots and they are not landing. And it is just it's weird. It's really weird to see. Yeah, because Luca's been this guy who's kind of built up this reputation for being like a playoff like dog yeah. up there with like playoff Jamal, playoff Jimmy. Mm-hmm. And you're like, yeah. man, this guy just like turns it up a level in the playoffs and that's just not been the case mm-hmm. in the early part of the series. I, again, I think that knee's bothering him, but at a certain point you're on the court, like you either got to stop taking the shots because they're hurting the team yeah, or, or whatnot. So I'm excited to see him the next three games, especially if you get a game seven, like can he just muster up one iconic mm-hmm. performance? But right now Shea is possibly trying to take him over like in, in terms of they're both top 10 players in the league, but in terms yeah. of, Hey, is Shea a little bit better than Luca? Both are good defenders. Well, I want to give Sh- Luca a shout out. Completely bought in on the defense since the series has oh, started. Yeah. He he is. They've been doing a lot of interesting stuff with him, like hedging and recovering in the series. So, guy comes off of the screen. He's kind of going out to make sure they can't get a driving lane. He's flying around the court in rotation. Like, despite his offense not being good, he has been a plus defender. Um, and that's really the Mavericks have bought into the defense. You'd think like Kyrie and Luca, two guys that we would not say great defenders. Would be, and they've really, exactly. And they've really bought in on that end of the court. And with guys mm-hmm. like Derek Jones Jr., PJ, and Derek Lively, you're like, the Mavericks have a fantastic defense yeah. all of a sudden. Strange. Very strange. Yeah. Never thought I would hear Kyrie being like a lockdown scrappy defender. But here we are. Here we are. Um I want to know your thoughts. What do you feel about like the Thunder team and all their like group interviews at the end and, and so like, the, the young kid energy are, they got going on? Yeah, I mean, I I love it. I love how much like they clearly are. They feel like a really good JV team that like is just all vibes and just like they're there for so much fun. And obviously, they're it's like a super young team overall. Um, it is gonna be it's going to be interesting if they do get knocked out by Dallas to see what the narrative is going to be is like, Oh, they need to mature. Or is it going to be like, no, do you stick with like the all vibe team? Because I know there's going to be these old heads that are going to be like, you need to lock it. You can say whatever, but it's just going to be really interesting. I think because personally no, I enjoy it, but I want to see what other people think. I agree. And I think, right. You can do this to a certain extent, but there is a mm-hmm. point where, every playoff win shouldn't feel as big. So right now for the Thunder team, it feel they're like sticking together, they're banding together for this playoff run. But if you go back, like your team is super young, you have all these draft picks, you're going to make the playoffs next year and you're going to yeah. have more expectations. So mm-hmm. at what point do you kind of stop the mentality of we're a group, we're going to stick together and like we're going to like kind of block out like we got each other because that kind of like you lose some of that. Now, maybe they'll stick to, stick it together for a while. I mean, you're like cornerstones of that franchise. Shea, Jalen, J-Dubs, Jalen Williams, and Chet, they've they've got the corners of that team locked down. So if they want to keep doing that, that's, that's for them to choose. But I do think at a point, you're going to have to stop seeing that a little bit just because for, for the Nuggets, this series against the Timberwolves, they're expected to beat them. They're expected to at yeah. least get to the Western Conference Finals. And that's where you're going to start getting the Thunder. We won't, we won't kill them if they don't beat the Mavericks. Um, yeah, it's our first year in this type of spotlight, but next year we're going to be like, you need uh, you to, more expectations. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it'll be interesting to see. I love, I love the narrative of people are talking Absolutely. about, are they mature enough? Cause they are, <laughs> people don't realize they are the youngest team by a country mile <laughs> yeah. to, to be in this spot. They're like 20, they're our age. Yeah, like you could like, if you put like our friend group together and like had us on the court, like winning NBA playoff games, like we would be ridiculous. Like we would be so insufferable <laughs> on the mic. Are you kidding me? You got Raj on the mic. Are you kidding oh my me, gosh, dude? Yeah. H- having him go up in a post game interview. And it's like, yeah. So like, what did you think about that? The other team's coach, uh, like really trying to put some pressure on you like defensively. He's like, yeah, they suck. <laughs> like <laughs> like we would so be insufferable. Accurate. <laughs> That's so accurate. I'm totally on board with the idea that we'd be insufferable on the mic. <laughs> oh my god, we'd be terrible. And I'd I think be running bits the entire time. Oh my god. And I'm not like it's not really an exaggeration to say they're our age. I think the average age of their team's like 23.4 or something like that. Like, like we're pretty close. Like, <laughs> it's one year. Like, god, honestly, like insane. we've we've reached the point. I don't know if other people. I don't know if there's many older people listening to this podcast, but I don't know if. 
like it's starting to hit me that these players in the league that I like look up to and I'm like, wow, they're so good are starting to become my age. Like Tyrese Maxey is my oh, age. God. We're and, getting to be unk status. It's going to be terrible, dude. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, I love Tyrese Maxey. That kid's a dog. And I'm like, kid? he's my age. He's like, <laughs> oh, he, God. Like if I was like, he could be in my college class. Oh, yeah. If, if we're like, we're still in college, he'd be in the class. Or even guys yeah. now who are getting drafted who are like Bronny James, 19, I think, years old significantly younger than me and i'm like I'm like oh. oh i've been thinking about Bronny for all these years kids 10 years old it's just lebron james's son but it's just like a weird yeah. like switch it's in. so strange yeah oh god but that's a, that's a, under mavericks i'm super excited to see games five six and seven they're gonna be blood baths um oh, i yeah. expect it to go seven and that game seven in okc is gonna oh, be electric. it's gonna be bumping it's gonna be and absolutely want, bumping. also i just want to give a shout out to the thunder and the mavericks fan bases they've showed Nuts. up Tyrese yeah. Maxey, John Calipari, both were at the Mavericks in uh, at the game last night in in Dallas. I think that's just super fun, great for the sport, um, and both fan bases and franchises have completely le- leaned into it. So Absolutely. shout out to them. Absolutely. The next series, the Nuggets win two games in Minnesota to tie up this series two two. It's been a complete tale of different halves. The T Wolves, yeah actually just kicked the crap out of the nuggets both games on the road in denver yep. and then the nuggets played one complete blowout and then one slightly closer game but for the most part they weren't close so we're going back to denver in a game five where the they've been kicked tw- in the head twice the timberwolves yeah. have been kicked in the head twice and now denver feels like they have all the momentum back in game five at they home really do. but the interesting yeah. point is that Denver lost both games at home. So I'm like, <laughs> you're trying to wrap your head around it. Yeah, it's really, really strange how this series could go. Like, the way the series is going, it could go to seven, and the Nuggets technically wouldn't be favored at home because yes. <laughs> they have a bad track record at home, which is insane because the Nuggets, like, historically have been so good at home. And then I guess, I mean, really, I think the Nuggets just were not expecting the Timberwolves to be this aggressive early on. Like, I think they really just, like, brought it to the Nuggets. They, like, really hit them hard. And, but then I think what ended up happening was, is that the Nuggets were able to then, like, use that aggression against them because obviously they're the defending champs they're not idiots like they're very they're obviously a very like high basketball iq team overall so they were able to figure out like hey if they're going to be really aggressive let's counter that like there's ways that we can work around this we can't just get punched in the mouth and then not do anything like you got to be able to throw a jab in there you got to be able to hook like there's things you can do but then you got to be able to execute and when you have the best player on the planet in uh nikola Jokic and playoff man himself jamal murray like yeah. you're gonna figure it out eventually yeah um i totally agree i think we talked about this last time i hate just being like oh a team won because they had more effort and energy but it's it just like i was it's oozing so out of the that screen that's what happened yeah and in, in game one and two that like, the timberwolves just won it's more and there's some more schematics like they're beating denver to their spots you try mm-hmm. to throw the ball into the post to Jokic, and there's a guy instantly on him and Jokic just kind of like it's in soccer like when you don't if someone passes you the ball and you stand and wait for the ball, someone up will come and steal it, but you have to kind of run to the ball to meet the pass. Yeah. Yep. And that's in the Timberwolves. That was like really reflective in games one and two. Um, and then I, Denver just had some more time to figure out the Timberwolves defense um, is, mm-hmm. is what happened. Um, there was three game days off between game two and game three. And that gave Denver the perfect time to kind of like yep. get it completely out of their heads, completely like scrap everything, hit many film sessions. And then, get back into it and i mean just game three was an annihilation and then game yeah. four game four it was at 13 points for a really long time every time it got down to 10 went back up to 13 down to seven back up to 13 eventually the nuggets pull away with the win and what could have been anthony edwards's most iconic game of all time and like yeah. put him on the map because that man was doing everything in game four he's had a fantastic series 33 yeah. five and five on great shooting but game four specifically reminded me of LeBron James in 2018 in game one versus the KD Warriors, where mm-hmm. he dropped 50 and the JR disaster happened because Anthony oh, was having God. an all time game. And just like Rudy Gobert, Carl Anthony Towns just didn't give him any support. And that's yeah. what loses you the game by eight points. And 
what they needed that game for because you kind of feel like now they're playing catch up on the nuggets yeah it's because now as you said it like earlier like the momentum has fully swung in the direction of the nuggets because now it's like okay you're rolling back you're get you're heading back to your uh to your own court you figure them out they're going to be aggressive but we know how to win even if Anthony Edwards has an amazing game. We can still win this. It's not like they had a terrible game and w- they blew the doors off of them and that you didn't really learn anything. You still learned a lot. Like, hey, yeah. Anthony Edwards is a dog, but we can let him score if we shut other people down and we know how to shut them down. So yeah. it's it's really does feel like the Nuggets are like, okay, we got this. We know how to win. And then now the Timberwolves is like, oh, we kind of just like we're winning off of being really aggressive and beating the crap out of the Suns. What do we do? So they need to come back. They need to adjust. They got to figure out how to get Carl Anthony Towns. Carl Anthony Towns needs to figure it out. I don't know what's going on with him. He's not been looking good, especially on defense. But no, because he's supposed to be touted as like, oh, he's a great two way player, or whatever. He's just not been looking good at all, which is also side note. Didn't realize he's been in the league for almost 10 years. Yeah. Thought this was like his third year. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, I think that's like Carl Anthony Towns hasn't been in the, uh, in the spotlight that much. And I think during the um, Suns prediction where I got destroyed because <laughs> for good reason, I really picked that series wrong. But I said part of the reason I picked the Suns was Carl Anthony Towns is not a good playoff player. And he was great. He was great in the Sun series, but he's been terrible mm-hmm. the last two games. And the games, like the reason I I picked Denver initially in six, and then I mm-hmm. picked Timberwolves in six after they went uh, up two zero because I felt like there was a zero percent chance they weren't going to get at least one at home. Like I felt like it was very likely they were going to get one at home, either game three. I thought they were going to get game four at home, and then they would go back to Denver, lose that game, and then they'd close it out at home in game six. But Carl Anthony Towns essentially. Mm-hmm has no show the last two games they've lost. He had he's averaging 14 9 and 3 in those last couple of games. And like you mentioned, the defense has been bad. Yeah. So all so all of a sudden, you've got your second best player on the team, no doubt, who's not showing up. Anthony Edwards has to do it all all himself. And the Denver Nuggets are kind of saying, "Hey, we'll let Anthony do what he wants to do. He can go get 40, but we're just going to stop everyone else from scoring. Rudy Gobert is not a good scorer. They're making him have the ball in his hands. It's not pretty." Um so, yeah, I agree. Carl Anthony Towns needs to heat it up in there. And then just talking about the defense a little bit, the Timberwolves are supposed to have some of the best defense in the league. Yeah. They do. In game one, they hold the Nuggets to 99 points. In game two, they hold them to 80 points. And then in game three and four, they score 117 and 115, respect- respectively. Yeah. So they've got to figure out a way, the Timberwolves, to realign themselves defensively, defensively for tonight's matchup. So we're recording this on Tuesday. The game five is tonight, and then this will come out on Thursday. So you'll kind of see this podcast before game six. Um, but and you'll kind of see our predictions here. But um, exactly. before we give our going forward predictions on this series, I did want to talk about the heat pack incident regarding Jamal Murray. Oh, my um, God. At the end of game two, Jamal Murray threw a heat pack onto the court. It looked aimed towards the well, ref. He who- threw two things. I, yes. fr- I think it was a towel, and then it was the heat pack. Because it was... Yeah, as you're, yeah, continue, please. No, oh, yeah. So the funny thing is, I think he threw the towel intending to, I don't get, I don't know if he was trying to hit the ref or like what his intention was, but he threw the towel and it was like, he was like, oh crap, this isn't heavy enough to like move. Because Go, like, I mean, yeah. you throw, you, you, it's like a hand towel. Like you throw, it's not moving anywhere, has no like weight to it. So throws a heat pack, goes on the court. He ends up getting fined $100,000, notably not suspended, and everybody is like freaking out about it. And I wanted to get, he should have been suspended. Like, okay, just one game. Like, dude, you can't throw crap onto the court, let alone near a ref. Like that's just not happening. Like you just can't do that. Like period. It, so you you, you can't have it. You would have liked to see him suspended one game, not like for a series or anything, but just one game. I, so uh, it's, a, it's a tricky spot right here because I agree that you like if you don't suspend him like they didn't do, you set a precedent. But on the other hand, I, I know Timberwolves fans are going to be like, oh, you should have been suspended. We would have been up 3-0. I don't want to see Jamal suspended because then we don't get the series right here. 
I have no doubt in my mind that the Timberwolves would be up 3-0 without Jamal. I think they would have won game four mm-hmm. and then they would be up three. They would be up 3-0. They're going to close the series out. So I would have liked to see Jamal suspended for games next year. And I know that sets a terrible precedent of not suspending guys for playoff games as it occurs. But I would have liked to see them suspend him for like five games to start next year. And that, say, okay, that's fair. Yeah. And I, I know what people are going to say. You have to, you can't just like spend him for games next season. That's saying essentially you can do whatever you want in the playoffs and it won't hurt you now. I understand that it looks bad, but it's also terrible for the NBA if the Timberwolves just sweep the Nuggets because mm-hmm. of the Jamal uh, heat pack incident. So I don't know. I, I know it doesn't set a good precedent for the league at all, but I'm happy he didn't get suspended because I know this series would have been bad. Um, it, yeah. on, I honestly think it could have ended in a sweep because you win game three and then the Nuggets are just like, just mail it in, in game four because mm-hmm. they're like, well, we're screwed. We're down 3 0. Also, side so. note, wild that Rudy Gobert got fined $75,000 for making like a like a money reference like oh the refs are getting yep. paid or something he literally got fined twenty five thousand dollars less than jamal murray throwing something at a referee yeah like, honestly, that's it's, insane i think they need to start like a there needs to be a bigger narrative about what people are getting suspended and fined for overall yeah. because again like i don't think the rudy money symbol should have been a seventy five thousand dollars suspension no. like on like it's suspension fine um that's just kind of ridiculous so then it makes the Jamal Murray look weird. But I'm like, just find him 500K. Like, give him a really heavy fine. And then... 500K? Half a million that, dollars? I would say that what he did is worth 500K if what Rudy did with the paying the refs is 75K. Uh, oh, okay, like, okay. I see what you're saying now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you so either like need if, to... Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's like... That's how I feel about that. Like, you need to... You need to set it needs a to be precedent. proportional. It needs to be yeah. a lot more proportional. So it's like you so, either drastically reduce the Rudy thing, or if Rudy really is going to be fine, seventy five k, you got to bump up the Jamal Murray one. I see. Yeah. Okay. And then so I know there's been other suspensions that have been like there, like Draymond gets suspended and get after <laughs> Game Six of the um, 2016. Be like I know like all of that. It's difficult. I'm glad Jamal wasn't suspended though, because it would have made the series worse. But it does set a horrible precedent for the league because now it's like, oh, I could lose 100K if I want to toss something on the court. Yeah, that, that's um, it. I feel like he got out of it because it didn't hit anybody or like oh, nothing yeah. happened. Like if somebody like slips and like, God forbid, gets hurt, like he's gone for the series. Yeah, like, that's 100%. like he's out. Well, I think that that's the weird thing too. Pat Bev got suspended four games or five games, one of the two, for chucking the ball at the fan mm-hmm. in, in the stands. And I think that's also another terrible precedent. Like, five oh, yeah. games like you actually made contact well not only did he hit somebody he threw it back again trying yes. to hit somebody again and it was with malintent like i don't know like we don't know jamal's intent with the heat pack incident because it was just Cause weird because I, I don't really like i don't i know some people say he tried to hit the rest i really don't think jamal would have tried to hit the ref with the heat pack like seems, that's just so stupid like there's yeah, no I, I, way you would try to do that I don't know if it was more of a like I'm throwing this on the court in like, protest, like, which is yeah. it still could have hurt someone. It's still a bad oh, idea. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But Pat Bev sat there and wanted to hit a fan with the ball. Did hit a fan? Hit did, the did, wrong yeah, fan? Yeah, and then throws it back, <laughs> and then the guy catches it, <laughs> and then get and they only got four games. Like I don't, like, yeah. I don't know. I think they need to figure out their whole stuff with suspending players and make it a little bit more clear because yeah, I, I don't. know. It's just all over the place. It really um, is predictions going forward for the nugget series um i would say nuggets and seven okay so who do you think it when do you think nuggets win game five at home yes i think it'll be nuggets wolves nuggets okay i'm leaning towards nuggets back to my original prediction in six i don't think there's i think the nuggets are going to win tonight at home they're feeling good Mm -hmm. game six will be a a buzzsaw game i don't think i think that game is going to be extremely close I mm-hmm. trust the Nuggets in crunch time a little bit, so I'm going to take them to win that game close, but I would not be shocked to see this come back to to mm-hmm. Denver in a Game 7, which that would be seeing Anthony Edwards like take on the defending champion, best player in the world, Nikola Jokic, in a Game 7 yeah. would be great for the sport. Oh, it would be so um, good. And super exciting, so that's great. Um, Carl Anthony Towns needs to show up going yep. forward. 
I think they're going to have to look at a lot more interesting lineups here. Like, can they play Cat at the five, put Rudy on the bench, and play a little bit smaller and get more athletic? Mm-hmm. Um, and then for the Nuggets, no one needs to really show up. Just keep doing what you're doing. Um, I think yeah. Nicole. I think Nicole Jokic hasn't had that like thirty point masterpiece 40 point masterpiece yet and it might yeah. be required to win a game five or game six like one of these games i think he's gonna have to have that class he's gonna have to have like that vintage moment where he yep. really pulls out like his full bag and just of just the dumbest shots possible him yes. just whipping threes yep and i and i would i would love to see it out of him um i think yeah. he definitely got questioned a lot during those two games if he wanted enough three times mvp obviously <laughs> all the stuff with he doesn't care about the championship. He just wants to watch his horses and stuff like that. Like everyone was really quick to jump on him for it. And he showed up the last two games, but I think really cement himself with a like legendary performance game five and six and be like, yeah. Oh, you guys thought I wasn't him. Like I came out yeah. here and just like pretty essentially swept the nug swept the Timberwolves after a rough two games to start. So yeah, what was chat- by the way, what was really yeah. funny. Sorry, I cut you off, but no, you didn't the, no, you su- didn't. the, the narrative of that. Uh, <laughs> Nikola Jokic doesn't like care about basketball. Or whatever is so funny because there's like the the, the two clips back to back of him being like, "Wait, I have to stay for the parade," and him like hating it, and then him drunk as hell at the parade, going up to the mic and being like, "Yeah, I'm glad I stayed for the parade. <laughs> like we're we're doing this again." Because <laughs> like, I don't think he I don't think he understood like what the parade was. He's like, "Oh, I gotta like stand out here all day." He didn't understand like, "No, we're drinking the whole time." Yeah. He's like, "Oh." now i get like, I'm here <laughs> i'm here for this it's so yeah, funny I, I would love to get into his head and just be like like how much does he care about basketball how much does he care about yeah. achievement and, and everything because it's very unclear i didn't i didn't like how he handled everything last year with the championship yeah. but um i have liked his response last two games oh yeah um and that shout out to again aaron gordon just a role player he had didn't miss a single shot last game yeah dominant and and you hear like what I love about this team is you hear them in interviews, besides the Jamal Murray interview, which is a disaster after game two. <laughs> um, but you hear guys like Aaron Gord, someone asked him, how is it so easy for you to play unselfish? And he goes, well, you got a three-time MVP over here who plays the most unselfish brand of basketball. Like, that's pretty easy. If the like three-time yeah. MVP, I can do it. I can do it. And same exactly. sentiment from Jamal. And you like, you see this team, like, they're really made of the right stuff. So mm-hmm. um, this is why they've come back down 0-2 and... Look, yep. take advantage i think they're probably huge betting favorites today i don't know exactly the line but i'd imagine they should be huge all over favorites them. yeah yeah all right we're gonna breeze right through the celtics Cavs series because again it's just not that interesting celtics lead the Cavs 3-1 not as dominant as i think they would want to be but it's the yeah. playoffs you got to win the games um i expect them to win game five at home to close yeah, out it'll be a Cavs. gentleman sweep like it because with yeah, because Mitchell was out, what, this past game? And yeah, game four. Just, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just not that interesting. Uh, note about Jason Tatum. He's 27-11-6 and six this series. Not shooting a great percentage, but it's been better the last two games than it was the first two games. I think for mm-hmm. the Celtics, you want to see him keep making improvements. He's been really bad in the playoffs so far, but you're going to need him to be that guy in the finals. I don't. I think the Celtics have a clear ride to the finals at this point. But to beat a Nuggets, to beat a Timberwolves, to beat a Mavericks, a Thunder, Jason's going to need to be a 27 guy on 50% shooting any given night. And I think mm-hmm. trying to heat him up a little bit and get some improvement going will be good. Yeah. But for the Cavs, just Donovan Mitchell being out, it's not great. I'm sure he's going to need to lead the team in game five. Obviously, some of it's been due to Jerry Allen be- being out all these games. I don't know if he's bound to come back at all, but mm-hmm. the Celtics just have too much talent too many good players right now and i think they'll win game five and close the series out close but hey Cavs, even the series if the Cavs can steal a game five suddenly you're heading back into cleveland um steal another game and then suddenly you're back <laughs> in boston so i don't see the three one comeback happening but they could make it interesting if they win this game in in boston and there would be a lot of chirping about if they can win the championship yeah. then yeah all right but let's, now let's get let's to the get one in- that we want to talk to yeah I, talk about I think you would agree after the Sixers next series, it was like, how can it get better than that? And I would say this Pacers series has come damn near close. It's come close. This past game wasn't as good, but yeah, I, I think it's been a really good series. Um, 
I mean, the Knicks are injured to hell and back. Um, They look so tired. And I think really the turning point of the series was that 37 foot dagger in game three from whoever. Yeah. From that guy, like just puts the game away. And I think that really was like the momentum swing that the Pacers needed because, and obviously the OG injury was huge because the Knicks are ridiculously good with him on the court and not as good with him off the court. Um, And it's just, it's been like, as a Knicks fan, obviously it's been a tough series to watch just because like, they're just so injured and like, you could tell they're trying to give it their all. And it's just like, it's just not enough. You can see it like just in the body language in the end, you can see them sudden, like where in the Sixers series game one, you were like, wow, this team is just bone rush. The Sixers, like every offensive rebound, every hustle play. But now you're like, Mm -hmm. oh my gosh, the Pacers are like so much more energetic than they, like, you can see it with your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, uh, yeah, it's, it's just been tough. Cause Halliburton's been, he finally has turned it on and yep. it's been, um, yeah, it, it, I don't know. It's just been tough to watch because like they looked so good. The first two games, OG got hurt. Brunson isn't a hundred percent heart. And, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just been tough. Yeah, it's tough. Mention Tyrese Halliburton. I give him so much credit. The last three games, the first game he played was terrible. He scored six points. In the last three games since he's been 37-5 and five on great shooting, he's really taken this game over. And I think a lot of that's due to the uh, some energy from the Knicks. And I, I, But I wanted to separate this a little bit. There's two avenues for the one to discuss the Knicks. Yes, the Knicks are injured, and that's really piled up. They're also tired. There's two different things. like Guys like DiVincenzo and Hart, they are tired, which has led to a decreased performance. Guys like Brunson, OG, Mitch Robinson being out, um, Julius, obviously, they're all injured and can't play. Um, but I think there's a combination of both. Like I think Jalen Brunson is injured and tired. I think Josh Hart is tired. Dante is tired. Hartenstein is tired. And then there's some other injuries that have added up. And it just feels like I think the, Knicks, the Sixers series took it out a lot of them. They played every single game in that Sixers series besides game three was close. It went down to the final shots they had to play. Josh Hart was playing 48 minutes a game um, and all that type of stuff. So when you play that many close games and then you come in, game one, game two of this Pacers series were close. Game three of the series was close. Then finally, after all the injuries add up, game four, it's like the wheels completely fell off and then Pacers just destroyed mm-hmm. them. Yeah. Um, Jalen's been still good, twenty nine and six. He's been on a bad shooting percentage the last couple of games. Again, I think some of that's a foot injury. Some of that's just he's exhausted. He yeah. he is responsible for so much ball creation in the half court. And you've TJ McConnell, Andrew Nembard, Tyree. Sometimes they're picking him up ninety six feet down the court. And yeah, it's just been tough to watch. It's it's brutal. It's just you can see the energy there. Um. Mm-hmm. And so it's a really tough series for the Knicks at this point. They've got a little bit of rest after the last kick. They got the bench guys early. Um, I I just, it's been a fun series. I just think the Knicks are hitting the wall. Yeah. And I don't, I guess we'll go into the question here. Do you blame Tom Thibodeau for these injuries at all? I mean, his style also got the Knicks there. So like, I can't necessarily blame him too much, but I mean, for the injuries, I guess, but I can't also then say, well, it's, I can't all, I can't say, well, this is all his fault because he is also the reason why we're there. So like, yeah. it's, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. I think I blame Tibbs. I don't blame Tibbs for the injuries necessarily. I don't think his style has helped some of the injuries. Uh, like a hamstring injury is a very common overuse yeah. injury could be there. I do blame him a little bit for some of the like tiredness that could be going on. Mm-hmm. Josh Hart playing 48 minutes in multiple Sixers games is probably something that you need to reevaluate yeah. in terms of, hey, is there any way we could get him a few more minutes just so he's not exhausted every single game? Um, is there a way that we can play Jalen Brunson a little bit less minutes, not having him bring the ball up all the time? And I know people are going to say, wait, hold on. Um julius is out he's a big ball creator that's gonna help but i'm not i don't want to go there because julius randall has been a terrible playoff player so i don't think it's just naturally yeah. we can just be like well julius would really help this team out it's like well josh hart and dante Vintenjo have been the next coming from like jesus christ so 
Um, yeah. I don't really know if you want Julius Randle playing right now, but exactly. I think there's a style of like the Knicks roster is not deep enough. They don't trust enough guys are playing all mm-hmm. these guys, huge minutes. And because of that, because of how tired they were in the Sixers series, you come into the Pacers series and they've got a deep, they've got a deeper roster. They're energized. They're healthy. And like Siakam just without OG being on the court, mm-hmm. looks like he has so much room now to just do whatever yeah. he wants. Yeah. Alrighty. So Peter did have to hop off real quick, but I'm going to sit here independently and go through a few more segments. Some stuff I just really want to talk about and then other stuff um, we're going to save for next time. So that's the next Pacer series. Personally, I think the Pacers are probably going to win game five and game six. Game five might be a tough one because they're going back to New York and that crowd is going to be electric, but they just like the Pacers have so much more energy. So we'll see you there. I think Peter thinks that might be a Pacers win too. Um, we're going to talk about Nick Wright's club superstore, but I want to get everybody's reaction on that. So we're going to uh, hold on to it. Um, he did a segment where he kind of puts 12 players in a superstar status. Who's kind of waiting in line to get into that club and who's getting out. We'll talk about it more next time. Um, as well as talking about like JJ Redick and the Lakers head coach. We'll all save that for the next time. Um, what I did want to touch on is Bronny James in the draft combine. That man has gotten so much media attention for doing almost practically nothing. I'm not a Bronny hater at all. I actually think like people have hated on his play a little bit too much. He came off of a heart surgery and then had his rookie, his rookie season over at um, USC. And I think like people gave him a lot of hate for like being overhyped and just being LeBron's son. And I don't think that necessarily was fair or deserved because he just came off of heart surgery and didn't have a typical build in like you end, you do end go quick, but, like you typically graduate high school in like May, June, and then you have a month or two off. You're working with the USC team and you build in for your year. But like the USC season started and Bronny James wasn't playing. Like his first game he played in was midway through the season because he was still recovering. Like that's not ideal for anybody, especially somebody who's still trying to get their footing under them in terms of like what type of basketball player they are. So now he's getting all of this like excess combine attention. And I think it's just a little bit overkill. He made 12 shots in a shooting drill yesterday at the combine. And it was like one of the more like consecutive, but like, I don't know. What do you do with that? Um, people talked about his height, not being as tall. He actually was. And, and all this type of stuff and all of that. I'm just like, it's too much attention on a guy who's going to be a second round pick and likely just going to be picked by the Lakers at the end of the day. So I would urge the media, even though they're not listening this far in the episode, to just kind of stop talking about Bronny James as much because it's a little bit too much. It's putting too much pressure on him. And I don't, I just don't like the whole like speculation of, I know some, I think it was a Colin Coward talked about like, Oh, maybe the Mavericks would get him in the draft. And then LeBron would want to come to Dallas and play with Kyrie and Luca. Like, I don't know, but I don't like giving it too much thought because we just don't know what's going to happen. I have no idea how people view Bronny, the prospect. He seems like he's a really great defender, but I'm as a Sixers fan, Matisse Thibel, was a great defender couldn't play a lick of offense he got eventually traded off the team now he's on portland and he had a little better offensive season this year but he's not a guy you can trust in the playoffs because you just don't guard him from three and he's a six six guard who can't play inside so that's just my thought on his draft combine i hope i wish him the best i just hope the media kind of stops like over talking about ronnie this is the segment that i really wanted to talk about and so it's not really a big deal that peter isn't here even though you get my thoughts on it because yesterday the draft lottery happened so we're kind of recording this on tuesday the monday was the draft lottery and it sparked a lot of controversy people saying as much as is the draft lottery fair and so in the nfl if you're the worst team you get the first pick and that's not how the nba works you have percentages of you put your name your balls in a little thing you spin them and then one comes out um and so the atlanta hawks were awarded the first pick in the draft it was atlanta hawks one Wizards two, Rockets three, Spurs four, Pistons five, Hornets six, Portland seven, Spurs eight, Memphis nine, Jazz 10, 11, Bulls 12, OKC, which is crazy because they're in the playoffs, 13 Kings, 14 Blazers. And this sparked a lot of controversy because the Atlanta Hawks, who were in the play in game, got the first seed. And some people are saying that it's not fair that they jumped up to number one. I definitely don't think it's fair that they jumped up to number one. Like in terms of like, is it, well, is it fair is a strong word. Is it unfortunate that they got up all the way one for other teams? Like this, uh, like people were talking about the Pistons falling out. Yeah, it's unfortunate. It's unlucky. But I also think it's really great for the sport. Number one, it decreases the value of tanking. So 
if you're the Pistons, this is, and you were trying to tank, which the Pistons weren't trying to tank, they're just bad. But if you were trying to tank, then this is incentive enough not to do it because you fall out. And then also, too, it gives other teams an opportunity to get a little bit lucky and feel like they hit a break. For example, the Hawks, they're kind of knocking on the door to making the playoffs. I mean, obviously, they were in the play in game, so they were kind of close. Um, but they got guys, Trey Young, Clint Capella, Aneko Kongwu, um, DeAndre Hunter. They've had guys in the past, Kevin Herter, um, Jalen Johnson, they drafted who's been okay for them this year. Like they kind of are knocking on the door and you feel like they need one more player, one more reason to keep developing and maybe they can get in the playoffs one more two years down the line be competing. And this is a great opportunity for them just to kind of make, first of all, make the Eastern Conference better because they're going to be another contending team and for the playoffs, that's just going to make the conference deeper. And then two, just for the fan base to get excited. And so for them, I'm like, you get the pick of the draft. Now, this draft isn't good, but you get the number one player you want in the draft. I would not advise them to just take the best overall available. Take the player you want, the player that you think is going to fit with your team, and then develop the team. You can do so much now. You could trade... Um, crap, I forget his name. Um, you can trade DeJounte Murray if you want to get picks for him. You can keep him and run DeJounte and Trey and this new guy who I hope is a forward, and then keep your center rotation how it is and suddenly you've got something there you gotta have one more two years you can trade um DeJounte like I said get players back run with Trey and you can just do a lot more exciting stuff with this so I think it's great because all of a sudden the Hawks have a lot of reason to be excited about their future where before it was kind of like is Trey gonna leave are we gonna trade DeJounte we're we just gonna blow it up and suck well you don't need to blow it up anymore because you just got the number one pick which is what you were gonna probably blow it up for next year so I love it but people this is what I really wanted to rant about, which is why it's okay that Peter's not here, is people are saying that they feel bad for the Pistons. And I don't understand how somebody can sit here and say they feel bad for the Detroit Pistons. So let's do a history lesson. The Pistons, I'm going to go through the Pistons draft picks since 2010 and let you know if I think they deserve to have a high pick. In 2010, they drafted Greg Monroe, number eight overall. Greg Monroe was cool. He was never at number eight number never like a top guy not a guy that's going to bring you a championship or make you lead in the playoffs in 2011 they had the seventh overall pick they drafted brandon knight that was a complete bust in 2012 they had the ninth pick and they drafted andre drummond drummond was cool and he was really good for the franchise he led them to multiple like playoff appearances not bad at all not a star either notably at 39 that year they draft chris middleton who now just won a championship as a number two option on the bucks in 2021 so they didn't like they drafted a good guy, didn't develop him, went to a different team. Two thousand, well, they did draft, they they traded him away, but like the same thing. Two thousand thirteen, at the number eight overall pick, they drafted Contavious Caldwell Pope. Um, obviously, he's been a great rotation player for the Lakers when they won in twenty twenty. For the Nuggets, they won last year, and for the Nuggets again this year. But he's not a number eight overall guy, and he never didn't really become like you traded him away. Two thousand fifteen, they don't have a pick in two thousand fourteen. Two thousand fifteen, they draft Stanley Johnson, number eight overall. He's just been a role player. 2016, you have the six, 18th pick. It comes a little bit higher water, but you draft Henry Ellison. Um, I liked the pick at the time, but it obviously didn't pan out. 2017, you draft Luke Kennard, number 12 overall. Not been a good pick at all. In 2019, you don't have a pick in 2018. In 2019, you draft Seku, Seku uh, Dumboya is from France at 15 overall. I love Seku coming out, and I don't blame him for making the pick, but it didn't work out at all. Seku's not even in the league anymore. 2020 this is a little bit more recent history you draft killian hayes number seven overall so far killian hayes has been a fine player not a great player not a player that's making a difference 2021 you draft Cade. i think cade has been pretty good he played 12 games last two seasons ago um last season he was okay the team was bad um his rookie year he was good you need to wait more time on him but he hasn't been like the like the number one overall pick that you say yep this guy's got it he's gonna make a difference because he's not as good as Paolo is he's not as good as Wemby is already um and so because for that reason you don't feel he's made or Anthony Edwards who was drafted a year after him so he's hasn't been that guy and because of that you start questioning the pick a little bit like you got drafted this guy number one overall 2022 you draft Jaden Ivy five overall again he's been cool he was a bigger name in like summer league and comes in and kind of gets buried in the roster a little bit and you're like oh what the hell happened to JV Jaden Ivy and in 2023 they drafted a Sir Thompson number five he had a decent rookie year. We'll have to wait and see. He's just he's just a rookie. Um, but the reason I go through all of this is they, again they never had like a besides Cade they never had like a lot of one two three picks. So I can understand from that perspective why you say, "Damn, 
the Detroit Pistons missed out. But it's not as if they haven't had opportunities. They had one, two, three overall eight picks. In the last 10 years, they have three number eight overalls, two number sevens, two fives, 12, 15, 18, and the first overall pick. Like It is not as if they haven't had an opportunity to draft guys. Tyrese Maxey was drafted at 22 for the Sixers, I think, or 17. Um, Steph Curry, a little bit later of a, of a pick in the first round. Um, Paul George, a little bit later of a pick in the first round. Like, and I don't expect you to hit on every single pick you make, but they really missed on a ton of players. And I, I can't go through each draft and see which guys they could have drafted. And I don't think I don't like playing that version of history. But fact of the matter is you've whiffed on so many draft picks. And because you've whiffed on the draft picks, I don't feel bad that you didn't get the number one overall pick because if you kept making great draft picks, I would say, oh man, they, I knew at number one, they were going to draft a star and they just missed out on the opportunity, but you clearly haven't been able to develop players or don't know how to draft players. And if you don't know how to do that, I don't want to see you make a draft pick then. I'd rather the Hawks go and draft the number one overall player they feel, let's say it's Alex Sar, go draft him and make him a stud to pair with Trey Young. I'm not confident that the guy the Pistons drafted is going to be a stud. I think he's just going to get buried on the roster and suck. So I don't think the Pistons deserve it. They have talent. They have Cade Cunningham. They have Jaden Ivey. They have a Sir Thompson. Those are the first, fifth, and fifth picks in the last three drafts. Go out and do something with the picks. It's not as if you don't have talent. Also, they've been able to pick guys up like James White, Johnson, uh, Jaden Durant, like these players. Like they, they have high pick, high talent guys on the roster. Go out and do something with it. We talked about this all when the losing streak was happening. The Pistons weren't a great team, but they have talent on their roster. There's no reason they should be this bad. Oh, I've, Killian Hayes, 7 1 5 5. Those are the last picks they had in the four drafts, and they're a bottom feeder team. Like, I don't feel sorry for you at that point. I'm like much more happy the Atlanta Hawks, who've been having late round draft picks, get to have the opportunity to draft high for once and like change their franchise around a little bit. So that's why I don't feel bad for the Pistons at all. You have top seven picks in the last four drafts, and you've you've gotten the talent on the roster. It either hasn't panned out, or you haven't had the coach and the player and the personnel. Even the Pistons had Sadiq Bay at one point, who was a good player. I think they drafted him, or they traded for him. Like, there's just no reason they they should be this bad. So again, I don't feel bad for them. Um, shout out to the Spurs again. This draft class is weak, but they have four and eight in this draft, which is super exciting. I think you think about pairing guys with Wemby, like. There's talk about, do you pair Trey Young with Wemby? And now all of a sudden you're like, oh, do we just go with the youth movement? If we draft well, put two more young guys around Wemby, who might be bench players to start, like that kid's already a star. Like the, the Spurs have a great future lined up. For the Wizards, staying at two is good for them. Um, I feel similarly with the Wizards. Like they've had some higher picks that haven't worked out, but they've had decent talent on their roster, prevented them from having number one overall draft picks as much. I do think them having a higher draft pick will give them a good opportunity to to do better in the future so that was the draft lottery i like it a lot it's super exciting again the fact that the thunder have picked 12 despite being in the second round of the playoffs and potentially going to the conference finals is bonkers what a job sam presti's done to just keep that team interesting and then teams like the kings 13 great to, great there so for them and portland s7 and 14 another like rebuilding tool for them so I just really wanted to mention that, no, I don't feel bad for the Detroit Pistons. I think the draft lottery is great for the sport. I love the idea that the Falcons came up. This is similar to the Zion situation, which is no one's talking about. Everyone's like, oh, happy for New Orleans that they got Zion. They barely had a shot to get Zion. They were like, I think a very similar position with the Hawks where they were like the 14th best odds. They jump all the way up and they get to draft Zion. Changes the fran- chase the face of their franchise, which I know now in hindsight, it's like, oh, maybe Zion isn't actually that good, but they could have still drafted Ja in that spot. Um so it's exciting. It changes teams. Um, if you're mad about it and you're like the Pistons, I don't know, go draft the stud at five. Go draft someone that you know is going to make a difference. And if you think that is drafting Bronny James at five, then go draft John- Bronny James at five. I, I don't actually think he should go- he's the fifth best player in the draft, so don't go do that. But draft the guy that you feel is the best player you can get at the spot who fits the best with your team and develop him into that guy. If you start to show me, if you're the Pistons, that like, Ugh. it just bothers me. I'm like such on a rant right now. 2020, you have the seventh overall pick. 2021, you have the first overall pick. 2022, you have the fifth overall pick. 2023, you have the fifth overall pick. And again, you have the fifth overall pick. I don't feel sorry for you for not getting the first overall pick because you've gotten the ability to accrue 
so much talent on the roster. So just go like make the right picks, develop your players, and be good. This is the Eastern Conference. You're competing with teams like the Wizards, the Hornets, the Bulls. Like these aren't good teams. You can beat them. You can be in contention. You can make the play in game, surely. And if not, I'm just not like gonna feel that sorry for you that you didn't get the number one overall pick in the draft. So that's my rant on the Pistons. Anyway. It's a great episode today. Really excited for the playoffs going forward. Again, I think the Celtics series probably closes out today, but we have three other series that are on game seven. Watch some really interesting narratives. Can Anthony Edwards elevate himself into a top five player in the league by potentially getting the Timberwolves out of this bad situation? Shea lead overtaking Luka. That's a fun narrative. And then for the Pacers, Knicks, can the Knicks just hold on and make the next round? Even if they do, though, they're going to be beat up. Um, Next episode, we're going to have Raj back. We're going to have Peter for the full episode. We're going to kind of dive into Nick Wright's club superstar a little bit. Um, Really cool graphic. If you are listening this far, first of all, I appreciate it. Second of all, um, you can go check that out in your own free time. Then you can come back for our take next week. We'll talk about a little bit JJ Redick for the Lakers head coach position. Um, And otherwise, we'll just have more playoff games to break down next week. So if you made it this far, we really appreciate you listening in this long. Again, a little bit of a weird episode since Peter had to head out midway and we didn't have Raj. But nonetheless liked recording get a little bit of solo time with me ranting about the pistons and how incompetent they are and other than that we will see you next time thanks for listening to episode 31 of the coconut curry podcast we'll see you next time